Hello, and welcome again to another Sunday Seminary Online. Uh, we will be talking today about uh, Paul's letter to the Romans. Uh, I'll set up an introduction um, to the situation uh, between Paul and uh, the, the Roman community of Jesus followers, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the bigger themes uh, like the law uh, and the relationship between uh, the Gentiles and Jews. Uh, as Paul sees it in Romans, uh, especially chapters 9 through 11. Um, and uh, uh, I won't be able to cover all of the material in Romans uh, by any means. As Paul would say, by no means. Um, I uh, absolutely couldn't uh, fit in, maybe even scratch the surface uh, of the theological depth uh, of Romans. But I'll, I'll give it a shot to give it an overview, and then maybe you can go back and uh, try to fill in some of the, some of the gaps later. All to say, Romans is a um, hugely important work of Paul's and also a really contested one. That is to say, lots of different Christian communities have different ideas about what's happening in uh, Paul's letter to the Romans, and many people have very strong beliefs about what, what they see here. So I, what I'm going to give you is how I see it um, after some study, and uh, it's informed by many New Testament scholars who uh, other people, many people will recognize some of who these scholars are as I, as I uh, lead us through. Um, at least my understanding of Romans, but it's a caveat to say, if you understand it differently, um, let me hear in the comments. Uh, let me know. So uh, let me begin by just saying this is the Roman Empire. This is actually from about um, 117 CE or AD. Uh, this is uh, the Roman Empire at, at some of its greatest extent. Um, this is not how the Roman Empire looked at the time of Paul. It was a bit smaller, but nonetheless, just to say uh, this was the world's largest empire. Uh, this was the largest empire the world had ever seen uh, and uh, uh, perhaps rivaled by the Persian Empire at its height. Uh, but in any event, uh, a massive um, uh, imperial system that dominated both Judea, which you can see uh, there on the east uh, coast of the uh, Mediterranean, or the Mare Interim. interim. Uh, and you can see uh, Paul's travels would have taken him uh, around this Mediterranean basin um, uh, to the north uh, of Judea and to the, and to the west. So uh, into what was called Asia Minor, what today we would call Turkey, um, but also then into uh, the Aegean. And so this letter is uh, uh, reaching a place that Paul had actually never been, and we'll talk about that for a moment. But uh, So Rome, uh, just up there in Italy, uh, is who this uh, the, uh, a letter was sent to, to the community uh, that was in Christ in Rome. Uh, here's an artist's uh, reconstruction, a kind of a model reconstruction of what Rome might have looked like, just to say uh, these other letters that we've been reading, places uh, like Corinth uh, or Thessaloniki were, were large cities at the time, um, but Rome uh, was unbelievably large, uh, and uh, th it's, it's just a completely different type of situation than any other place that Paul's writing a letter to uh, in terms of its urban structure, size, and so on. Um, Paul amazingly doesn't mention the church. Actually, he mentions it in um, the, he uses the word church in uh, chapter sixteen, but not not when referring to uh, the community who, to whom he's writing the letter. Uh, um, he doesn't talk about the ecclesia. Um, remember that word ecclesia meant um, not uh, it didn't yet mean church like we use it um, in, in any of the senses of the word church. Uh, it meant town council, and so uh, in in the the Greek and then later Greco Roman. Uh, political structures of the day. The ecclesia was the town council. So the town council really probably was lots of little house churches meeting together for a regional church meeting, um, but they called it this kind of town council meeting, um, uh, uh, thinking of the church in kind of a, a political and um, uh, theological way. But in any event, there's no mention here of the of the ecclesia, um, in part the church, what we think of as the church, in, in, in part because uh, uh, Paul is writing to this massive community um, that probably had lots of, I mean, maybe there were hundreds of, of small little house churches that would have met um, uh, the, throughout the week um, in, in Rome. We don't know, really. Uh, that's another thing to say. We don't know a whole lot about the community in Rome at the time. We know a couple of things that I'll get to in a moment. But just to say that when we, when we read Romans, just think of this massive urban structure. Um, many different people who, who would have been addressed in this letter um, uh, it's kind of th scattered throughout that town. Um, here, of course, today is uh, the, the Forum in Rome, uh, which if you visit, you'll hopefully someday soon we can go back and visit Italy. Um, but here you can see that this is um, uh, in ruins, but still gives you a sense of the grandeur, the size um, uh, of Rome. And this is just the main sort of central administrative uh, forum in Rome, and of which there were actually other forums even next to it. 
Uh, here's a little artist reconstruction of what this area might have looked like um, uh, at the height of the Roman Empire. And yeah, these massive, massive urban structures, but also the center of uh, imperial power and the center of the imperial um, uh, kind of cult and so on. So I'll keep that in mind too as we move through Romans. So, Letter of the Romans, I got a little uh, medieval uh, image of Paul here. Remember, the, uh, he's often has a receding hairline like me uh, and is, uh, uh, is always writing, right? He's just the, the kind of patron saint of writing these letters. Um, so we think that uh, uh, Romans, the letter, Paul's letter of the Romans was written sometime around 58. Um, this is uh, in part because of some of the comments that Paul makes um, in, in the letter itself that he's kind of done with a big part of his mission. And what he's done with is really Asia Minor and Greece, that he's, he's kind of done all that he can do. This is kind of a strange thing for him to say because there would have not have been that many churches at the time. Uh, Paul, there's a lot of people in Asia Minor Minor and in Greece who would not have heard of the gospel yet. Uh, however, Paul kind of says that he's done. He's about going to move west, and he says in chapter 16 he wants to move on to Spain. Uh, so this is this is part of this larger argument, but he says first he's going to go to Jerusalem and then to Spain. Uh, so this kind of helps us to situate uh, that it's probably sometime near really the end of Paul's life. Um, some people in fact, think that this is uh, the last letter of Paul. Uh, Philippians uh, may have been written earlier while in prison. He may have gotten out, and then he's writing Romans uh, afterwards. Philippians may be later as well, but it's one of the things biblical scholars do, try to put these things in, in some kind of order uh, based on the, the small the amount of information that we have. So remember that Rome is the capital of the empire, um, and uh, for that reason, uh, people who lived in Rome, uh, were they had to uh, live up to certain standards that the, if the, the empire would crack down on people from time to time, as we know, uh, and Nero cracked down on Christians, um, but also there was an earlier uh, persecution uh, of Jews in Rome, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Um, because it was the center of the empire and because it seems to have had a sizable Christian community at the time, oh, Paul doesn't use Christian. Remember, uh, we'll get to this again um, later on, but Paul doesn't really think about things in terms of Christians versus non-Christians. Um, uh, but he says there, there are people who are in Christ. Uh, so that, that's his word. He always says, you know, then he begins the letter here, Paul is serving Jesus Christ and so on. And he's, he, he's always talking about the people who are in Christ, um, en Christo. Uh, that's, that, that's his term instead of uh, Christian. Uh, and part of this is that it doesn't have, it doesn't have a, um, uh, it's, not, it's not a new religion for Paul. This is not actually a new, a new movement. Um, and we'll get to that with uh, chapters 9 to 11 later on. But anyway, uh, Rome is this uh, massively important community in the ancient world. Uh, and then, of course, the Christian community in Rome would have been seen as really important too. Now, um, in later Christian uh, uh, sort of, in later Christian belief and in, in tr later Christian traditions, um, this is associated with Peter. The last we hear about Peter in the book of Acts, he's in Antioch. We, we don't hear about him after that. Um, and actually, actually, we don't hear about Paul going to getting to Rome uh, in the book of Acts. It ends before he gets there. Um, early Christian tradition is that Peter was very important in, in the early Roman uh, church and that Paul ends up there and is crucified as well and um, is, is, is executed, sorry, by, by sword. It's Peter who's crucified upside down according to church tradition. But uh, this is not found in any ancient documents um, that date to the first century um, or even the second century that we, we know of these things. It's, it's a, a, a later church tradition, so it all might be true. But just to say in these letters, we, we hear about Paul wanting to go to Rome. We never actually hear about him getting there or doing anything with it. Um, so uh, he's, he's in a way trying to um, ingratiate himself uh, to this community. And we think it has something to do with his, his uh, purpose of writing this letter. But all to say, it's kind of setting the background for, for what's going on in Rome. Uh, again, we don't really know that much about the Christians, but the one piece of evidence that we have that there are even Christians in Rome uh, uh, before uh, Paul writes this letter, um, besides the letter itself of Paul, which suggests that there were these large communities. Um, but in 49 CE, uh, uh, the Emperor Claudius expels the Jews from Rome. Like they were actually banished from Rome and they were allowed back in once Claudius dies. And that is uh, s uh, several years before the letter to the Romans is written. So uh, there's this massive event. And the, the Roman uh, historian Suetonius uh, says that it was uh, th there was a disturbance over Crestus, which is probably a kind of bastardization of the word Christ, right? I mean, it's kind of a, a mangling of, of this in, in Latin by some guy. He had no idea who Suetonius doesn't know who Jesus is, and he hears that there's some sort of fight among the Jewish community over this Crestus guy, and so then there was this banishment of the Jews from Rome. Now, there might have been other reasons. Maybe that wasn't even the reason. We don't really know. We don't have a lot of information about this, but it seems that the, Jew the sizable Jewish community, there might have been 50,000 Jews living within ancient Rome, and for an ancient city, that's huge. A 50,000-person ancient city would have been an enormous city by itself. That's just the Jews living in, in Rome. Um, so these Jewish uh, 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 residents of Rome were expelled, had to leave the city, and, and were banished, and had to come, come back in later. In the meantime, there were probably Gentiles, right, who were 
Jesus followers who remain in the city, and then later on, their Jewish brethren who have been kicked out. And remember, at the time, there's not much of a distinction between you know, Jewish Christians and Jews. That is to say, if you were a Jew and you were a Christ follower, you were still a Jew. Paul thinks he's still a Jew. Paul doesn't never says, I'm a Christian. I've left behind Judaism or something. I left behind being a Jew. He says, I'm a Jew throughout this letter. Um, so so the, the Jews who, uh, who were Jesus followers, the Jews in Christ who left, and then it can't come back, now find a community that's been thoroughly dominated by Gentile interests uh, that probably are thinking a bit less about, um, about the law or thinking a little bit less about this kind of um, uh, Jewish Christianity that we might see reflected in, say, the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew itself is, d does not seem to see that there's a big difference between... Uh, uh, th th there's not a distinction between Jews that follow the law and Jesus followers that act like Jews and follow the law. In the Gospel of Matthew, that's that's everyone. So there, this, this might have been the type of Christianity that was uh, uh, kind of booted out of Rome when Jews left and then returns, and so then there might be this conflict within the community um, uh, right about the time that Paul writes the letter. So Paul's letter deals really with the relationship between Jews and Gentiles, and this might be a big part of why Paul writes this letter. Uh, another thing to say is that uh, Aquila and Priscilla or Prisha, as Paul calls her Prisha in Romans, she's called Priscilla in Acts. Maybe she went by two names, a short name, long name, we don't really know. Um, but these, this couple, Aquila, a man, Prisha, a woman, uh, were uh, evangelists. Um, they, were, they preached the gospel throughout um, uh, Asia Minor, it seems, and they were Jews. According to Acts, they were Jews who were from Rome. They're mentioned here in the letter to the Romans, so that makes sense. Um, that they were expelled uh, from Rome at the time of Claudius because they were Jews you know, they, during the expulsion. Uh, then they were wandering around uh, Asia Minor, and they run into Paul. Uh, preaching the gospel, and then they help him for a while. So that, that, that's all part of this kind of background, is that um, uh, Paul has, has met these Roman um, Jewish Christians before, so he might know something about uh, what they represent and what they believe. Uh, and then this last one that, unfortunately, I've, well, let me move myself here. Let me, let me displace my face. Um, uh, so then the Jews come back, right? And as I said, this is kind of a, a, a potential problem, at least, um, uh, for the community there. Okay, so now Paul himself... Has, he admits in the letter he's never been to Rome. So this comes before the end of his life. Uh, if he ends up in Rome and is uh, executed there, this is before that. Um, Paul uh, is leaving, according to his own words here in chapter 16, he's leaving Greece uh, and Asia Minor. He's leaving the kind of Greek lands behind. He kind of says, like, mission accomplished, <laughs> which, again, I said it might be a bit strange to say that, but he decides to head west. He says he's going to head to Spain and share, share the gospel there, and he wants to use Rome as a jumping-off point. Rome would have been a great jumping off point, of course, because you can refit there. But also, it seems that what Paul's really saying is that you are the center of the empire. You all have a pretty wealthy and large and sizable community. Can I get a little bit of help? Uh, as I said earlier in, in the introduction to Paul video, uh, Paul is running a giant operation. It re relies upon so many people, uh, and it really does take money. Paul's proud that he's not um, uh, a burden on certain communities like in Thessaloniki uh, and, and in, uh, the, uh, for Colossae, or I mean uh, for the, the Corinth, um, for the Corinthian community. So he's, he's proud that he's not a burden on them, uh, but at the same time, uh, he still needs money for his operations. Um, so uh, he's probably going to um, hit the Romans up for that, but he also wants to hit the Romans up for more uh, because, uh, again, largest city in the world, uh, the most wealthiest city in the world, the center of power and so on. They probably have a little bit of extra cash. And Paul is really interested in taking up this gift for the, the church in Jerusalem. Uh, so Paul mentions this um, in uh, Corinthians. He mentions this several times, in fact, that he, and he mentions it here in Romans, that he's got this gift. It's kind of this big plan. So this gift that Paul is gathering, it's for the Jewish uh, Christian community in Jerusalem, and he's gathering it from all of these countries, uh, all these nations. Uh, in the, you know, we think of the Gentiles. It's really you know this kind of the, the nations, uh, the goyim in Hebrew. Um, all these nations that Paul has been calling to uh, faith in Christ, um, and Paul is going to gather up all this money. Uh, from these churches and then bring it back to what he says is the poor in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem actually was probably much poorer than any, uh, you know, uh, Corinth or Thessaloniki, any of these big Roman cities, right? Jerusalem was objectively poor. Um, but also, he probably wants to bring that money so that the church can do work, uh, ministry, um, uh, to the poor in Jerusalem. Uh, so Paul sees this as part of much, his much larger plan, kind of an eschatological so for Paul, this is kind of a situation like Isaiah chapter 2, where Paul's going to gather up the gifts from these different nations. Uh, and if you haven't seen this, uh, just read Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4 real quick. 
This is about all the nations of the earth streaming to Jerusalem with their gifts. And Paul says he's going to bring this. Now, Paul might be doing this for several reasons uh, beyond just being good. Uh, part of this is that he is a representative to the Gentiles. And he probably uh, is feeling conflict, as we've seen in Galatians and also in Acts, uh, conflict with the church in Jerusalem for several reasons. Um, one is that uh, they might not want people to be Gentiles <laughs> and, and in Christ. They might want people to become Jews and then become a, a Christian you know, followers of Jesus. Um, again, there's this uh, 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 conflict over Paul's understanding of the law in Galatians, right? I mean, this probably would have been very unpopular uh, in the church in Jerusalem. Uh, so, I mean, Paul, Paul talks about how in, in Antioch with the Jewish community there, I mean, he was rejected. So, Paul might be doing this as a show of goodwill to try to get the Gentiles to understand their place in the order of things. That is that they owe gifts. Uh, the, you know, the gospel came from the Jews. They owe the Jews material gifts, but also because they're, they're fulfilling the mission. Um, Paul talks about himself as kind of fulfilling the mission of God uh, by bringing in the Gentiles. That's his job. And then the end time can come. That's the way Paul seems to see it. Um, that once the Gentiles kind of are ushered in, that, that this is the end. Uh, and in the end, in a good way. That is the, this is the culmination of, of the world and of God's plan. Uh, so this is uh, uh, probably all wrapped up in, in Paul's uh, idea of bringing a gift to Jerusalem. And he might want to ingratiate himself to the leaders of the community there. Um, also, what's strange is that in Acts, we never hear of Paul bringing this gift uh, to, to Jerusalem. And it just doesn't seem to be a big, a big deal. So we never hear anything else about this gift ever again, even though we know it's one of the most important things to Paul from his letters. So whatever happened, we don't know to this gift, uh, but... Wish, I wish we, we, had, we had some kind of knowledge, but we don't. Uh, Paul also in uh, Romans seems to be defensive about his ideas and his teaching, especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis Galatians. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to the, more of that in a minute when we talk about the law. And this is kind of an interesting thing here, uh, that Paul uh, in Romans seems to lay out more of his uh, thinking than he does in many other letters. Uh, it, he doesn't, it, it's not a full theological treatise. It's not a systematic, I mean, some people treat Romans like it's, a, it's Paul's systematic theology. He wrote his textbook of all his beliefs. I don't think that's the case at all. Paul does seem to be trying to introduce himself to the community in Rome um, and to tell them a bit about himself. And he seems to be telling about himself in a way that uh, highlights um, his teaching about the law and the relationship between Jews and Gentiles. And the reason is probably because of the, the uproar that's been happening in Rome uh, about Jews and Gentiles and so on. Uh, but also probably um, because Paul has had his teachings misunderstood in Galatians, and he may be wanting to try to rectify this. That is that Gentiles may have heard his teaching about the law from Galatians, and they might have said, great, then we don't have to care about any of this Jewish stuff. Um, and Jews may have heard his teaching about the law and said, this guy thinks that the Moses and the Torah are terrible. Uh, forget him, right? So that is to say that, that Paul may be playing defense on both sides um, uh, of his accusations. He wants to clarify his teaching really primarily about the law um, and justification. Uh, so that's that, that seems to be what we get some of in, in the letter. Uh, Paul also seems to send this letter with a woman named Phoebe, uh, uh, who he calls a deacon. So we have a woman deacon carrying this letter uh, to Rome. Is she from Rome? Uh, we're not exactly sure. That, that part comes in chapter 16. Um, it also mentions uh, Junia, and it says that she's one of the greatest of the apostles. So what we see in Romans 16 is this uh, much higher status in terms of the institutional church that is, uh, that, that is represented by women here in the story, um, something that seems to have changed uh, within a century um, uh, or maybe two centuries or so on um, uh, within the church in Rome. But I'll leave that story for someone who knows more about it. But this is just an amazing um, uh, sort of insight into ancient um, church uh, uh, church life. Now, this is an interesting thing, too, that Romans uh, v chapter 16 may not have been, uh, it, it was cut off of certain versions of the letter. So this has led some people to say that it's late. It's, it's Maybe it's a part of a letter to the Ephesians, or it, it, this is a different letter, or maybe it's not original. Um, I think it was original, but uh, chapter 15, it was, it was left off of some ancient manuscripts, probably because it was just so personal. Um, in order to make it more applicable to more, more churches, um, Rome was actually left out of chapter 1, and uh, chapter 16 was cut off of the letter. Um, but I think the fact that chapter 16 exists and persists uh, you know, shows that it actually is integral to the letter. These letters are occasional letters. They are not uh, a pure theological treatise or something like that. Okay, so Paul, um, uh, in this letter, talks a lot about the law. And what he means is the Torah. He means the, uh, the, the first five books of the law, the first five books of, of, of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, and he's talking really about um, the obligations that this seems to impose. Now, this is really important for us to get because a lot of the way that Christians, especially Protestant Christians, read Romans is filtered through Martin Luther and John Calvin and later readers um, 
who are understanding Romans in a very different context than the way that Paul is thinking about it and, and are imposing a lot of the um, uh, kind of over-the-top uh, rhetoric and polemics about the Roman Catholic Church in the 16th century. They're imposing those ideas onto ancient Judaism when they don't really fit exactly. So what I mean is this, um, uh, the idea that like the law justifies you or something. Um, ancient Jews did not believe that like the like following the law got them a to get, to get into heaven ticket or something like that. Um, ancient Jews believed that the law was founded on grace. God started this gracious relationship with Israel for free, for nothing, uh, for no purpose, you know, or cause other than just the God. God loved them. God, this is election, right? The guy, the idea that God picked these people, and then God was going to just bless them with this unmerited gift of of uh, salvation, which came in the Exodus. God saved these people from bondage and oppression and slavery and, and gave them a new life. And then also God gave them the law, which was a gift. It was a gift because it organized their world and life and taught them a lot about God and each other um, and taught them uh, that they should pray to God and that they should sacrifice to God and that they should organize uh, their ethical principles in a different way and so on. So it, it was all seen as a pure gift. Uh, it was also seen as an obligation, a covenantal obligation. God made a deal with us. But that covenant goes both ways. That is that Israel puts obligations on God too. God is going to be there for Israel. God's going to help them and so on. So that is to say, it's not just like God gave tasks and if you do with them, then you then you get into heaven. That just doesn't correspond to, to the how any ancient Jew would have understood how the law functions. Ancient Jews would also say that the law doesn't save us. God saves us. Uh, God saves us by God's gracious acts, like the Exodus. We didn't earn that. Um, instead, the law, what the law does is that the law um, uh, helps you to be righteous. It helps you to live a holy life, helps you to live a good life. It helps you to, to live a life of uh, uh, wholeness and integrity with God and with each other. And that, that that's why it's important. It helps you to be a good person, to live a good life, to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That, that's the, the whole purpose of the law. Um, so if you mess up, uh, you can atone using using uh, a sacrifice. Sacrifice is a way to atone or fix your relationship with God. Uh, uh, but also that uh, involves also a change of attitude and of action. You have to you have to actually do stuff, right? You can't just keep it sacrificing. This is what the prophets get really mad at. Amos gets really mad at this. You think you're going to sacrifice your way out of this problem? Uh, Micah says, no, you can't just keep sacrificing stuff and get out of this. What God wants is justice and righteousness, right? Walk holy with your God. Um, if you read Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, it's all big conversation where God says to the people, why did you not treat each other nicely? And then the people say, uh, how much can we sacrifice to get our way out of this? And then Micah the prophet in chapter 6 verse 8, the famous verse says, no, you, you can't sacrifice your way out of this. Um, you know what God wants from you, O mortal. God wants justice and God wants righteousness and God wants you to walk humbly with God, right? Uh, all of that is um, uh, living the law. That's what the law tells you to do, and that's so. Uh, uh, in any event, it's just, it's it's a very different arrangement than many uh, Christians imagine. Um, uh, ancient Jews thinking that they're not going to earn their righteousness um, uh, through, and so and Paul says that in here that they're, they're not going to do that. But this might be what Gentiles might have been thinking that, right? So we're dealing with Paul's letter, which addresses both Jewish Christians uh, and uh, uh, and Gentile Gentile Christians who may have a really weird understanding of what the law is, and these. Um, super apostles that uh, Paul talks about in Corinthians or the, uh, the Judaizers that he talks about in Galatians. These people may have not been Jews. They may have been Gentiles teaching this really strange message about how you have to become Jews and then earn your way into the law. And so Paul might not even be addressing um, uh, Jewish understandings of the law currently at the time. So as I mentioned, Galatians and Romans have this really close relationship where Paul seems to hate the law in Galatians. He's really mad about the fact that uh, these Gentiles want to become Jews uh, by acting out the law and then uh, and then earn their way into heaven in some way. Um, uh, and Paul says, no, that's not at all how this works, right? Uh, in, 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 Gal in Romans, Paul seems to be um, upbuilding the law in some way, and especially in chapter 3 and in chapter 6. Um, Paul says some things that like are... Would might sound strange uh, if you have just read Galatians. Like, for example, um, uh, in, in, in chapter 6, uh, Paul has this, um, or chapter 7, chapter 7, Paul has this really amazing bit about uh, the law and sin uh, in chapter 7, verses uh, 7 uh, through 13. And he says, uh, the law is holy. This is verse 12. The law is holy, and the commandment is holy and just and good. The law is holy and just and good. <laughs> I mean, that if you just read Galatians, you think that the law is 
it might be terrible if it was. That might be why he's writing Romans the way he's writing Romans. He's trying to say, no, I don't think that the law is actually terrible. I think if you're a Gentile and you think that following the Jewish law is going to save you, that is a huge problem. And then it becomes worthless to you and even more than worthless. It's totally leading you away from, uh, from God's gift in, in Jesus. Um, uh, so, and it, it, he even says this interesting stuff in chapter 7 about how it kind of creates this, uh, creates the sin that it, that it judges in some ways. But I, want, I don't have time to get into all that, but it's really fascinating uh, a bit of conversation there. Uh, so, as I said, there might be this kind of positive spin in a way on the law in Romans, at least a little bit, right? It's not, the law doesn't save you, um, but also the law is good and holy and just and true and, uh, and it exists for a good purpose. But not, it's not really that helpful to Gentiles. Um, that's part of what he's saying, uh, especially if what you are after uh, is trying to be in Christ. That's, it's not going to get you there. Uh, so uh, Paul um, uh, lives out these, these arguments, really. He kind of imagines an interlocutor and then has this argument. And he goes, well, what about this? By no means, right? This is an ancient uh, uh, rhetorical device called a diatribe. And it doesn't just mean someone's going crazy, they're all mad. Um, it really is an ancient form of writing uh, where someone imagines uh, in, in a conversation and then has this conversation. And it's usually kind of uh, boisterous and so on. So that's what Paul's doing. When you read Paul in Romans and you, he says something and then he says no, um, the first thing he said then was uh, was was what his imagined uh, uh, conversation partner said, and then he's denying it, and then he goes on and says his point. So that's, you can kind of go back and forth using the no or by no means as a way of saying, okay, before that, that's what he's disagreeing with. After that, that's what he's agreeing with. That's what he, he, say, he thinks. So what was one of the big things uh, in this letter? It's about justification and salvation, the relationship between those things. So justifying, uh, in a way, is uh, to be uh, made right uh, before God and to, um, uh, to kind of I mean, there, there's different ways of speaking about what justification actually is, but being right with God is a decent way to think about it. And for Paul, the big problem here, as he lines out in Romans, is sin, which he uses all kinds of metaphors for, lots of different metaphors, including uh, alienation, like being separated from God, separated from your neighbors, right? Um, uh, all these different, you know, slavery he is a metaphor that he uses to talk about uh, uh, sin, that it enslaves you, it holds you down, and uh, forces you to do things you don't want to do or that are bad for you and your neighbor and so on. Um, so Paul talks, he's lots of different words to talk about uh, uh, the problem, and he doesn't have a very um, specific, uh, clear, non-metaphorical mechanism for talking about what sin is. Uh, so all to say, um, we, we have to continue to think with Paul on these metaphorical terms. Uh, he's not terribly clear, and maybe that's the point. Uh, but uh, uh, the solution to this problem of sin, that is to say this uh, sin that kind of divides us from God or pushes us away from God or that enslaves us to, to, to living our lives in bad ways, um, that hurt hurt ourselves and hurt our neighbors and hurt God. Um, the solution to this is that is God, right? Uh, so not the law, but also you know not our own righteousness, not our own. You know, so the solution is God who saves through the death and resurrection of, of Jesus. This is Paul's kind of most clear teaching here. Now, for many Protestants, uh, this has meant uh, that the entire book of Romans is really about uh, individual justification by faith, right? It's about me and me going to heaven because I believe in Jesus. I'm going to argue that the entire book is actually structured in a different way. That's not really the main point of Romans. Um, uh, he also, uh, uh, Paul, in writing this letter, talks has a bunch of different metaphors he uses for talking about what actually happens. Um, this salvation act or the saving act uh, and justification itself, the, the making right between you and God. What what actually happens? Well, Paul never really spells it out precisely. Uh, what he uses are these, again, these images, a wide variety of them. Sacrifice is one thing, um, but it might not be the same kind of atonement that we read about and hear about um, uh, uh, in in Reformed theology in many ways, or in, in the history of Christian theology. Um, in Romans uh, chapter 3, verse 25, uh, it says, uh, God put Jesus forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood. Um, a sacrifice of atonement, that sounds like, you know, the blood paid for us, etc. Um, but this is actually maybe not what Paul means here or is talking about here. A sacrifice of atonement could also be the the, uh, the place of atonement, um, that is the mercy seat. That word atonement is the same word kippur, which is to cover over or to, to be the mercy seat for the place of so Jesus is in kind of space of atonement or is the place where this kind of function happens. That is to say, um, a lot of the very uh, detailed theologies of, uh, of Jesus' blood paying for us, uh, etc., um, or in some way uh, that Jesus had to die, his blood uh, cleanses us, and, and uh, something happens there that's a bit like uh, the sacrifice of animals in the Old Testament. Of course, that's there in Hebrews. It's there, uh, it's there in Paul's letters every, every now and again, but it's not some 
core central meaning uh, to the death of Jesus. Um, redemption is another thing that's kind of buying back or buying someone out of uh, debt slavery um, or heroic intervention. There's times where Paul talks about Jesus kind of being a hero, almost like throwing yourself over someone who is uh, on the subway tracks and saving them, you know, uh, having the subway ride over them and over the, over the tracks and, you know, you've saved them or you push them out of the way and you get hit by the bus instead. That's sometimes the way Jesus is talked about uh, in his death, but also reconciliation that Jesus' death um, creates this reconciling event um, with people. So again, Paul is all over the map where it comes to um, uh, what this precisely means uh, for people. So if you read through Romans, just take a look at all the different metaphors uh, that you'll see there for uh, um, for what happens between us and God. What's the what's the what's the the solution uh, to this problem of of sin? In chapters 1 through 4, Paul really uh, spends a lot of time uh, building up this kind of what we might call the judicial um, uh, a, a metaphor uh, for justification and salvation. Um, that uh, uh, in some way we were being condemned, and now uh, the law, uh, Jesus, through Jesus' death and resurrection, um, we are kind of off the hook in some way. Um, we've been let off or atoned in some way uh, uh, that, that we're, we are now free from it. Um, uh, and this is where he talks about yeah, Abraham and, and justification by faith. In chapters 5 through 8, uh, Paul seems to shift his main metaphor. And uh, some uh, New Testament scholars have called this the participationist um, uh, uh, participationist kind of metaphor um, for justification and salvation, that uh, for salvation itself. I mean, what happens when we get saved? That we have somehow been, we, we, we have been baptized into Christ's death and Christ's resurrection and then the spirit living in us uh, helps us to live a life of resurrection. Uh, and that this is a really different way of talking about um, uh, our relationship with God and also the salvation, the moment of salvation, uh, then this judicial metaphor. So just to say that Paul's letter even breaks into kind of two halves of different ways uh, that Paul is envisioning this act of death and resurrection of Jesus and how it relates to us personally. So um, I'm not saying that one's better than the other. What I'm saying is let's admit that there's multiplicity of these images and also to if, if there's one that we use to the exclusion of all others, maybe we're missing something. And maybe these other images would lead us to um, think about ourselves and God and, and our neighbors in different ways. Uh, so let's let's try them all on, right? Let's try them try them out. Um, so uh, uh, to, to move to the kind of the main argument here um, is that uh, chapters one through eight of Romans have often in the Christian community been uh, seen as the central argument of Romans. This, this is where the kind of the bread and butter. And then 9 through 11 is this kind of like afterthought. It's kind of like eh, something happens after there. And I, I mean, even some some preachers that I have spoken to, just, they just won't preach on Romans 9 through 11 because it doesn't matter anymore. Like who cares uh, about this stuff? Really 1 through 8 is where all the good stuff happens. And then like, you know, 12 through uh, 12, 13, those are interesting to some folks and it's kind of, you know, what practical, what are we supposed to do with our lives? Uh, and then 15, 16 is the, you know, kind of a um, uh, good goodbye and farewell stuff. And then, you know, so we might just preach Romans 1 through 8. That's the real textbook uh, of, of salvation. Um, I, I think that's a really, really bad way to read Romans. Uh, if you uh, take a look at chapters 1 through 3 in this uh, kind of careful uh, building up about an argument about the law that kind of culminates uh, at the end, verses 21 through 31 of chapter 3, that's what chapters 1 through 3 of Romans have been building to the entire time. That's kind of the culmination of the first part of the argument. And then chapter 4 is like the... Um, we might call the the example. Uh, Abraham is the example of this. Uh, so th this is Paul talking about what's, what do we do with the law? Um, uh, how are our Jews and Gentiles uh, related? Or the Greek is one of the you know, words that Paul is using here to talk about Gentiles, the Jew and the Greek, or everyone else, the Jew and the everyone else who's not a Jew. Um, and, uh, and in part, uh, Paul seems to be... Um, uh, uh, Putting, uh, making a really strong case that um, that Jews are actually more important than Gentiles here. They're more important. They know more about God. They have more of a history with God. Um, definitely don't get your on your high horse if you're a Gentile, um, especially the Jews get kicked out of the city and then they get welcomed back in. No, these are your kind of elder brothers in the faith and sisters in the faith who are being welcomed back into the city. So all to say, um, Paul is saying uh, in chapter 1, verse 16, um, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now he's saying to everyone, right? Which means uh, that the Jews uh, who are uh, Jesus believers uh, can't uh, you know, keep the Gentiles out of the, out, or tell the Gentiles they have to become Jew first to get in. Right? This is Paul's argument against that. But also, Paul's arguing uh, that uh, the Jews got this for message first. They are the elders in the faith. Remember, Jews try, uh, Jesus, uh, Paul is trying to get this collection from the Jews who are Jesus followers in Rome. Uh, and the Gentiles who are Jesus followers in Rome, to be able to bring um, a collection back to Jerusalem uh, as part of his uh, way to live this out, right? The, the, the Gentiles owed the Jews something uh, for this. Uh, so, in any event, um, uh, this is, this is uh, 
th this whole first three chapters, we can say, is trying to think through um, the relationship between Jews and Gentiles uh, in terms of God's righteousness and the law. Uh, and uh, then uh, this example of Abraham, right? Uh, Abraham is someone that Paul loves so much because Abraham was uh, reckoned righteous in chapter 15 of Genesis, and that's before he had circumcision, and it's definitely before the law. Circumcision comes in uh, Genesis 17, uh, so there's no outward mark of uh, Jewish inclusion in the community. Um, there's no ritual that's occurred yet um, that, that is particularly Jewish. Um, uh, uh, Abram was sacrificed, but everyone in the ancient Near East did that, so he's just a dude. He's a regular guy, and now he's been uh, uh, reckoned righteous um, by God. Uh, so therefore, we can the Gentiles can be reckoned righteous in God and not be circumcised and not have rights. So you can see how Abram plays this really important place. So not to say that circumcision is bad, Abram doesn't. It's not to say that being a Jew is bad. Uh, Abram um, is kind of the, the the progenitor of this of this group of people. Um, but at the same time, um, humanity is bigger than that, is what Paul's saying, and that God deals with people in their own ways for their own kind of ethnicities. However, all those ethnicities are one day going to be brought to Jerusalem to worship the God of Israel in Jerusalem, <laughs> right? So this, this it's a pretty complicated picture here. Um, but basically, Paul is reading things like Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, and thinking through how this is going to act in his own role in it. Um, okay, so then chapter 5, uh, Paul uh, has this uh, extended metaphor. I mean, he talks... There are other things in these chapters, but mainly um, he talks about uh, Adam and Christ, uh, and this has often been used to discuss uh, to to justify um, a theology and a theological idea uh, called uh, original sin, and it's really all comes from not all coming. There's a lot of things in the Bible that people can point to to talk about something like original sin, um, but where it really has its its core uh, in terms of its biblical witness uh, is in chapter 5 verse 12 therefore just as sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin and death spread to all because all have sinned that word because in verse uh, 12 in chapter 5 uh, in the vulgate in jerome's translation in the in the roman church so this is right around the year 400 uh, um, jerome is translating uh, he's, a, he's a monk who um, is living in the Middle East. He's living near Jerusalem, and he's uh, tra talking to Jewish um, uh, to, to rabbis. He's learning Hebrew, at least in part. Um, he's working with uh, Makrina. Uh, he's working with uh, women who are helping him and probably know Hebrew better than he does, but they're working together to translate uh, the Vulgate, uh, uh, the, the Bible, into Latin, a kind of a better translation. Uh, uh, if in the day, there was an older Roman translation that was bad. Uh, so uh, in that version of Jerome's translation, uh, it's instead of because all, it, it was in whom. So death came through to sin, and so death spread to all in whom he had sinned. So that is to say in whom, uh, so Adam sinned, and then this spread kind of went it through. So really the Greek there is because, so because all have sinned, death and sin have spread. So all to say that original sin isn't quite as clear in uh, chapter 5 as many Christians imagine it is um, all the same. If you don't think about it in terms of like Adam sinned, therefore dead, death spread like a disease to everyone, but instead everyone has sinned, that seems to be kind of uh, uh, unquestionable in both the Old Testament and uh, in the New. Uh, and then uh, uh, it, there's this kind of uh, it, it, really an image of the, that Adam is representative of all the people who have sinned, including me, uh, and that uh, Jesus is the representative of the new possibility. Right, and then the death and resurrection comes next, talking about uh, uh, that that Christ died, and we kind of die with Christ in a way. Um, uh, this is part of that participationist conversation, right? Christ dies, and we kind of die with Christ, and in baptism we have died with Christ. That's our enacting of that death, uh, and then we rise uh, out of baptism. We rise in a way with Christ, who has been risen to new life. So this uh, um, conversation then leads Paul to say, well, but. But we still do bad things, right? And then chapter 7 is in many ways talking about, well, what do I do with the fact that I've been baptized, but now I still have this urge to do bad stuff? I thought I was supposed to be kind of a new person and so on. And then in chapter 8, that's where we see his, his theology, really, which is that um, when you have been baptized and you were in Christ Jesus, uh, that in some way the Spirit is going to kind of uh, make you a new person and, and transform you. Uh, and this seems to be a process. It's going to take some time. Um, but the Spirit of God now dwells in us, is doing this work of like renovating us and transforming us and is kind of kicking out um, the Spirit that lived there before. Uh, so uh, so in, in chapter 10, I uh, said chapter 8, verse 10, but if Christ uh, is in you, uh, through the, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. 
Uh, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give you give life to your mortal bodies also through the spirit that dwells in you. So this is like the position that we're in now. So we don't we don't have full resurrection yet. Remember the Corinthians, they thought that they were had been already raised or something like that, and so that they were living living uh, in a world that kind of the, the, the perfected world or something, which is why they were shocked that people were dying too. Uh, here Paul says, no, that you're in the middle of this kind of uh, a period of, of renovation. So all of this is not just trying to get us to think about ourselves. This is all trying to say, this is building up to this crucial moment, which is chapters 9 through 11, which are hard to read and are somewhat contradictory in some ways. Um, but I'll give you my interpretation of it, which really um, uh, builds up to chapter 11. So the big issue here is that um, the Jews rejected Jesus and for the most part. Uh, most of Israel, or the Jews, uh, have, have not received Jesus as a savior. Um, so why did that happen? But also did that mean that God has now kicked the Jews to the curb? Um, is God uh, kind of going with the Gentiles now? Um, and Paul's big argument is no, uh, not at all. Um, he recognizes that most Jews have not, uh, uh, they are not Jesus followers. They have rejected this this word, right? Um, they have continued to do what they're doing. But, but Paul says in chapter 9, verse 4, they are Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs and matriarchs. And from them, according to the flesh, comes the Messiah. They have everything. Uh, and nothing they can do, it's, it seems, according to Paul, um, is going to separate them from God forever. The, so this, this uh, kind of... Uh, in chapter 11, Paul is wrestling with this idea that he wants full inclusion of the Gentiles. So in chapter 11, verse 12, now, if their stumbling means riches for the world and their defeat means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So in a way, he's saying that Israel um, has stumbled and that this has given the Gentiles a chance to join in with the church. So, uh, again, God is predestined the Jews uh, to be chosen. Uh, they are the chosen people. God has not rejected them. In chapter 11, verse 1, has God rejected his people? By no means. And then verse 2, God has not rejected the people who he foreknew. So, Verse 6, but if it's by grace, it's no longer in the basis of works, otherwise grace would no longer be grace. So they can't earn their way in, etc. They're not gonna not gonna the law's not gonna kind of get them into heaven or something like this. You know, they, uh, this this is uh, it's not gonna bring the resurrection about on its own or something like that. Not that many Jews are thinking that that's gonna happen, right? But uh, in any event, um, so he has this thing, well, so what are the Gentiles doing now? The Gentiles are there to kind of make Israel jealous in some way. Uh, so uh, the Israel is um, uh, it's supposed to look at the Gentiles joining this movement and say, wow, boy, I wish I was there now because that hasn't happened yet, uh, right? <laughs> but but another, nonetheless, uh, but he's, but Paul says that Israel will be fully included uh, in chapter in chapter 11, verse 12. What will their full inclusion mean? Well, that'll be awesome. And then verse 13, uh, I'm speaking as, a, um, as an apostle to the Gentiles. So Paul knows here that he's really uh, the Gentile advocate, but he still wants to be the Gentile advocate who takes Jewish matters seriously uh, and who wants to have a uh, full uh, a positive relationship between Jews and Gentiles. Um, that's his That's his role. Uh, so then uh, verse 17, but if some of the branches were broken, he has this kind of extended metaphor of the tree, really the tree of life here, the Eitz Chaim. I want to remind us all that the tree of life is the name of the synagogue in Pittsburgh. Um, that was the site of the atrocities last year, um, which lets us know what happens when uh, Christians um, and uh, people who live in Christian cultures um, end up uh, rejecting Jews and uh in some way, um, imagining that uh, uh, Jews are the problem, or or something like this, um, and and the the response is to 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 get rid of them. This is uh, horrific, uh, but also would have been unbelievably horrific to Paul, um, who says. What has happened is uh, that there is a tree of life, and that's Judaism. Judaism is the tree of life. And what Gentiles are, are they are things that have been grafted into this tree through Jesus. That is that what Jesus has really done is kind of knocked a hole in the wall of Judaism and allowed some Gentiles to get in. That's what we are. That is, I say we, I'm me, I'm uh, uh, Irish and Croatian and, you know, English and whatever, you know, all the uh, people, peoples like me of the world can get into this movement, uh, can can have in some way a relationship with God that is given to Israel. Um, and it's still, I mean, always was, will be given primarily to Israel that, that Gentiles can kind of find their way in the back door, as it were, grafted in, um, uh, uh, in into this movement because of what Jesus did. Um, so then he ends by this by saying in chapter 11, verse 26, and all Israel will be saved. 
He really believes that. Now, some Christians have said, no, no, he means, uh, he means Christians there by saying all Israel. Um, in, Ge- in Galatians 6, he does mention this. Uh, he he, he t- talks about like the Israel of God, which he mean, means to be the, the, the church. Um, but in Romans, he's definitely not talking that way. This is not how he's been talking in chapters 9 through 11. He doesn't say Israel and mean uh, the church. And he actually never says that anywhere else in his letters besides that one time in Galatians 6. Um, so here, all Israel will be saved. He means Israel. All of Israel will be saved. We don't know how. We don't know. Obviously, he doesn't really go into it in detail. But just to say, this is the culmination of his letter. This is what this letter really means to him. Okay, uh, there's way too much <laughs> else about the letter to talk about. Um, but uh, but Paul's eschatological salvation, I think the, the, his vision of what is happening at the end time, is both tied up with the point of the letter, especially in chapters 9 through 11. But it's also tied up with the reason that he's writing this letter primarily um, uh, to, to be a jumping off point for him to talk to more Gentiles, but also for him to collect this offering that's going to begin uh, the bringing back of the, the riches of the world to Jerusalem um, to enact the end times. So more about end times later, but uh, thank you for sticking with me, and uh, uh, I hope you all have a good and blessed day.